The scripture reading for today is Judges 7, verse 17 and 18. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall we show you do. When I blow um, with a trumpet, I, I and all that are with me, then blow the trum trumps also on every side of all the camp, and say the, the sword of the Lord and of judging. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nicholas, for doing the scripture reading. Vinny, I just wanted to make sure that you are paying attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vinny. I apologize because I gave him that scripture just today. And the one that I gave Richard yesterday was the verses 20 to 21. But the context is the same. So, Amen. Once again, thank you, Ruby. You know, when we go to heaven, they say we are going to sing, all of us. The Lord will take more time with the rest of us, I'm sure. But I thank God, because we shall all sing. Praises to the Most High God. Last week on Sunday, I was privileged to participate in the Adra Fun Run at uh, Crystal Palace Park. So that is uh, me and the Pastor Kirk, Pastor Kirk Thomas, I think. He's the director for the ministerial uh, department from the conference. So yeah, that was me after my six miles. I would like to encourage you to take part in that event because it happens once a year. So please, I'll, I'll actually, encourage you. You can walk, you can run, you can stroll, as long as you finish your quarter. That's all what matters. But I did run for six miles anyway, just for the record. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Sabbath, 25th of March and uh, 1st of uh, April, we were in Germany. So we went to Seller Adventist Church there I met uh, this pastor, he's a retired guy, but he congregates, he, he lives in the area, so he goes there for church. And interestingly, he did study at Newport College, and he ministered there for some time, he taught there for some time, but now he's retired. So he said, okay, when you go back to your church, please extend our regards. So I bring you greetings from Seller SDA Church. But today we'll be looking at uh, the story of Gideon, which I've entitled, all right. all right, okay. We are looking at the story of Gideon. I, I, I thought you wanted to give me some stuff. Oh, good, I love it too. <laughs> the story of Gideon, which comes from the book of Judges. I've entitled it, Finding Hope in hopeless circumstances. But before we go into the word, let us close our eyes for a prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your love, for your care, for your compassion on us. Thank you, Lord, for preserving our lives to this moment. Lord, as we go into your word, I pray that you send your Holy Spirit to be with us. May you speak to us, Lord, and give us receptive hearts. Lord, may you be with me in a special way so that whatever I say here should bring glory and honor to your name. For I ask and pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I'll ask you to turn your Bibles to the book of Judges chapter 6. So we'll go through the story up to chapter 7 verse 1 or something like that. Finding hope in hopeless circumstances. 
These were hard times. Judges chapter 6 verse 3 gives us an overview of what was happening around this time. The Midianites would come into Israel and plunder their crops. The Bible records that they would come as locusts. And we hear that when Gideon, when Gideon was a young man, there was a seven-year period where the Midianites would pack up their tents, come into Israel, and steal all their, crop, uh, all their crops, harass them from left, right, and center. As you can imagine, this was a very pretty, hopeless situation. But what did the people do? They cried to the Lord, and God sent a prophet. And the prophet comes and says, okay, you see all this that is happening around you. Something has gone wrong. Remember, I'm the God who took you out of Egypt. I delivered you from the hand of Pharaoh. And once I delivered you, I commanded you not to worship those gods, but to stick with me, because I am your God. But what have you done now? You have departed, your, you are departed you are departing from me and going back into worshiping Baal. That is why all these things are happening to you. Moving on with the story. We see Gideon, he's sitting under a terebeth tree, doing what is very unusual, because people are supposed to be pressing wine in that place. But we find Gideon, because he's hiding away from the Midianites who are about to come in and plunder them again, he's pressing his, uh, he's uh, shredding his wheat uh, in this place. Now, a conversation goes ahead with the angel who appears to Gideon. Take notice the way he salutes Gideon. He says, the Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. And Gideon is surprised that how come you call me mighty warrior? In the first place, I'm not coming from the elite of the nation. I'm not even the oldest. How come you call me the uh, great warrior? And the angel, who happens to be the Lord himself, if you go through the story, tells him that uh, I am the one who is sending you. The conversation goes on up to such a point when Gideon has been asked to bring some offering, which was uh, put on the rock. And this angel touched that offering with the, uh, the rod that he had in his hand. Fire comes out of the rock and consumes the offering. And now Gideon, his zeal is kindled. Now he understands what, what, what is happening around there. He goes out and he breaks down all the shrines that were around and he asks people to worship the one true God. The story of Gideon is famous, especially when we come to the point where he defeats multitudes a big, big army with only 300 men. But looking into the story, there are a number of lessons that we can learn just besides the torches and the trumpets that these people had. Let us remember that if we work with God, God will work with us. Gideon made himself available and ask the God to be with him. If we make ourselves available to God, he is there to use us to benefit people who are around us and even to benefit his church. But there's something that we have to do. We should go out there, we should go back to our places and destroy all the idols that we are holding so much close to ourselves if we want God to use us. As we look into Gideon's story today, now we come to that point where the Midianites and the Amalekites are getting closer and closer towards the Israelites so that they can start another round of uh, harassment. But now look what happens. Judges chapter 6. Let us go to verse 33 up to 35. I'll wait until you get there. 
Judges chapter 6, verses 33 through 35. Reading from the King James Version. Then all the Midianites and Amalekites, the people of the east, gathered together. And they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet, and the Abizarites gathered behind him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. And also sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, and they came up and met him there. Do you see what is happening here? The spirit of the Lord came to Gideon. And he puts out this uh, request or this call to bring people, to recruit some uh, uh, people who would come and fight for the Lord. And I'm sure that the spirit of the Lord was also working on these recipients of the message, so much so that we hear 32,000 people responded to the call. That is what happens when our call is initiated by the spirit of the Lord. Now, can you imagine what was happening in the mind of Gideon? Watching all these patriots coming over, assembling, ready to go into war. It is no wonder that Gideon, he turned back to God for the final confirmation. Going through with the story, verse 36 through 38, Gideon says to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the uh, threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And it was so. When he rose early in the morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowlful of water. Remember, we have already said that if I want to work with God, God will work with me. Now, first with this intimidating situation, he found himself in a very hopeless situation, but Gideon still did not allow his fear to waver him or to shrivel him from his task. He did not get discouraged by the circumstances around him. He did not get discouraged by the difficulties that we are seeing on the horizon. Remember the Bible records to say these people were like locusts. You could not even count them. But Gideon never lost hope. Instead, he worked with God and God used him. Verses 39 and 40. Then God said to Gideon, then Gideon said to God, sorry, do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just one more, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry on the fleece, but on the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on the ground. I love my God. You know, God wants to have conversations with us. We need to have that time when we can sit back and have a dialogue with God. At the moment, as most of you know, the boys are not here with us. They are with their grandparents. The best time of my day, regardless of who, how much hustle and tussle I've had during the day, is when I get home and I speak with Jonathan. He says, hello, daddy. That alone saves it all. How much more with God who created us, who knows our difficulties, who knows our frailties, how much more does he want to hear us speak to him? We have a number of young people in the congregation. I was young once. I know the difficulties that you go through, but God is waiting for you to speak to him. There were times when, uh, you know, life is full of making decisions. Should I do this or should I do that? Should I go for her 
or go for her. These are the decisions that God wants us to come to him with. Gone are the days when young men and uh, young women would pray that, Lord, please make her the one when you're already holding on to it. Leave it to God, and God will show you which one is the right one. Even looking for a job, there is no decision that God is going to take lightly if you come to him and ask him even for a sign. When I was a toddler, a year or two, my father had to, uh, he, was, he, he grew up as a Presbyterian uh, Christian. But then he came across the Adventist message, so much so that he got convinced and uh, decided to give it a try and see if it is the real deal. But still he had some doubts within himself and then he said, God, if this is your will, I want you to show me without any reasonable doubt that this is what you want me to do. So it was on a Friday, he decided to go to church on Sabbath morning and he said, Lord, I will leave my house tomorrow in the morning, but now this is what I want you to do. With the same pace that I leave my house, I want to enter the bus with the same pace. Did you get what I said? Did you get what I said? All right. Obviously, he had to jump into a, into a bus to get to the church. So he left his house Saturday morning start, and uh, started walking to the bus stage to jump into the bus. Lo and behold, when he was about two or 300 meters to the stage or to the uh, bus stop, that's what you call it here. We call it stage there. To the bus stop, he saw the bus coming by. And he was about to start running, and then he remembered that, no, 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 I said, with the same pace that I leave my house, with that same pace, I'll enter the church. So he continued walking. The bus came to the stop. For whatever reason, it never left. Whether it, the engine went down, or maybe there was a, a passenger who wanted to come off, or whatever reason it was, the bus never left until he walked all those 300 meters and he jumped onto the bus. You can call it coincidence, but I call that God's provision. There was a young lady who was looking for a life partner. And he prayed and said, God, if you want me to be sure that this is the person you want me to be with, give me a sign. And this is the sign that I'm putting forward to you. Tomorrow I'm going in this train for a trip. The person who offers me an orange, Lord, make that, let it be that person. That, make that the signal that that's the person. You know, in, in Malawi, oranges are not popular. We do have, uh, you call them nectarines? All over the place. But oranges, not as much. So this lady jumps on a train, going on her business, walks in a young man with a few kids. Obviously, he's not the right one. He already has kids, isn't it? Maybe that would be the first thing that goes in some people's heads. But, okay, let the roll, let it go. So they sat next to each other, they traveled maybe for 20, 30 minutes. Somewhere along the journey, the gentleman opens his bag and pulls out some stuff, gives it to the, uh, to the kids that he was with. And then there was an orange, which he offered to the lady. And the conversation breaks out. Ah, so who are you? Oh, no, actually, these are my, uh, this is my cousin. This is my auntie's daughter. I'm just taking them to their mother. Wow. And the conversation get, got into another gear and another gear, and they got married eventually. That person is not me, obviously, but I know he actually testified they are happily married until now. They have got a three, four children, still saving the Lord, happily married. So all I'm saying is God wants us to speak to him. There is nothing that is too hard for him. He says, try me now and see 
if I will not open even windows of heaven and shower you with blessings that you will not even have room to keep them. That's, that's the God that we serve. And that is the same God that Gideon served. Back to Gideon. Now it's time for war. Judges chapter 7 verse 1. Gideon has now gone out. He broke all the bow shrines and has requested all the people to worship their God. Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harod. So that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moriah in the valley. I would imagine all these 32,000 people who have been recruited to go into battle were so much excited. Remember, they have been under the oppression of Midianites for seven years. This was the moment that they were waiting for. Let us just cross over the enemy lines and go into battle without even waiting for rules of engagement. But the Lord continues to give instructions to his servant. And the Lord is about to teach Gideon another lesson of how to maintain his hope. We just sang a song, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. So for us, after we have found this hope, now we need to know how to maintain it. Verse 2 of chapter 7, And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hand, lest they claim glory for themselves and saying, for, uh, lest they claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Quite interesting. 32,000 people, that's too many for me to work with you. And we see that this group of 32,000 is reduced to 10,000. God gave a principle in Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, 20, verse 8, that if at all you are going into battle, anyone who's uh, faint-hearted, all those people who are scared, uh, they don't want to go, let them go. Do not force anyone to go into battle. That's the same principle that we may need to apply when we are going even for evangelism. If people don't want to work for God, let them be. It is even better to go out there with a small band of people who are determined, who are responding to, the, to God's call to go, to go out and do something for the Lord. Because all these people who are just joining in, all what, that, what they will do is to slow us down is to slow the group down, is to bring in bickering and chattering and all kinds of nasty things. So people who are not willing to go and work for the Lord, let them be. We can pray for them, we can encourage them, but do not twist their hands that they need to join the band. So God brings down the number to 10,000. But still, moving on with the story, the Lord says, no, 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 that is still too much for me. Take these people down to the river. And down to the river they went. We assume that this was a free water river so that they had to drink from the river. And the psychology behind the criteria for choosing these over those, we don't know. God knows. But he says, only those people who go into the river and lap with their hands, those people will go with you. But the rest of them who just go on their knees with their hands, with their heads down into the water, those are not fit to go in my battle. Leave them aside. And so it happened. From a group of 32,000, you can imagine, only 300 men were selected. Wow. Can you imagine what was going through their heads? Can you imagine the level of morale that was there. I can speculate that probably some of them were saying, ah, but there was 32,000 of us, now it's only 300. Is it even worth it going ahead with this general of ours? 
looking at if numbers is anything to go by, from 32,000 to 300 men, are we really serious, gentlemen? But now the Lord, if we work with God, God is going to work with us. And with that band of 300 men, Gideon goes into battle and he defeats the Midianites. This is one of the most famous battle stories in the Bible, where 300 men with a trumpet and a torch, they defeated thousands and thousands of soldiers. And the Bible goes on to say, these enemies, they started killing each other. That is how God works. You know, sometimes we tend to limit God. We tend to put God in a box that he can only do that. He cannot do that. Who would have imagined that uh, Mel Gibson, who is not Adventist, actually went for the challenge, took the role of uh, directing this movie about Desmond Doss, a movie which highlights the fact that there are people in this world, people who are walking this earth, who decide who can choose to stand firm to God and lift up his banner, come rain, come sunshine. You know, God encourages, encourages us in so many ways. And encouragement can come from very unlikely sources. That is one such lesson that we get from the story of Gideon. But now after achieving all these good things, there is one last lesson that we get from Gideon. If we read from verse 22 and 23 of chapter 7 of the book, after the came out of battle victorious. Verse 22, then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. What a splendid, what an, encouraging, what, what an encouraging response. Gideon realized that the victory was not his. It was all about God. You know, sometimes maybe we get so pompous because of the achievements that we have had in the vineyard, so much so that we don't look at God anymore. But may the Lord help us to realize that whatever achievements we make, it is not us but him. Not I, but Christ. It doesn't matter how many people we baptize, we baptize into his fold. It is not us, it is him. It does not matter how many people are being encouraged by the way we conduct our businesses. It is not us, it is Christ. And Gideon gives a very encouraging response to say, I will not be your, I will not be your king. Neither will my sons or my grandsons. Because only God, the one true God, is your king. But there is a twist to the story. Verse 24 and 26. Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you that each of you would give me an earring from his plunder. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread out a, government, a, a garment, and each man threw into the earrings from his plunder. What is happening here? Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and the papal robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were around their camel's neck. What is happening? Gideon has already said that I don't want to be your king because only God is your king. But then, probably, he meant well. Just give me these uh, 
earrings that you have plundered from war. And verse 27 goes on to say, out of that, Gideon made an effort. We remember what an effort was? This was a piece of uh, attire that the priests used to put on their chest. Some commentators have gone to, uh, on to say, probably Gideon, because of the conversation that he had with the, the angel right there under the tree, the angel who happened to be the Lord himself, maybe to an extent he thought that he had the credentials of, be, of, of being a priest. The Bible doesn't say that. These are commentators who are commenting on the Bible. But whatever reason was there, Gideon decided to make an effort, which in itself was not a bad thing. But verse 27 says, and this became a snare to Gideon and to his house. He meant, for, he, he, he meant well, but because it's not what God was pleased with, it became a snare to him. The last lesson from Gideon's story is that after we have obtained this hope from God, in the hopeless situations that we have, we should learn, we should ask him to help us to maintain that hope. Let me submit to you, church, this morning, this afternoon, rather. I must only let go to my ego so that I maintain this hope that is found in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. A story is told about the US uh, Senate chaplain, Barry Black. I'm sure we have heard about him. He's a very good speaker. He's a very good preacher. He wrote a memoir from Hood to the Hill. That's the title of his memoir. Now, Barry Black recalls a story where he was uh, having, whether it was tea or dinner, with the, one of the admirals uh, from, the, from the US Navy. And this old man gave him a piece of advice, and he said, Barry, whatever you do, son, don't get shipwrecked in the shallows. This is exactly what Gideon did. After having a victorious, prosperous life, he got shipwrecked in the shallows. As a church, we have come so far. There are so many things that we have done for the Lord, and the Lord is pleased with us. We have obtained this hope. Let, let us be careful not to be shipwrecked in the shallows. When we can actually see the finish line, if this was last week's Sunday, I would have said this was at 5.82 miles. You could actually see it, and you stumble and fall, and don't finish the race at all. Let us not get shipwrecked in the shallows, just as Gideon did in them days. The Bible records to say, as soon as Gideon died, the whole congregation of Israel went back into sin because of this thing that was create, uh, erected within them. My prayer to you this afternoon, and my prayer as well, is to ask God to help me to build my hope in nothing but in Jesus Christ, so that as we go into this battle, fighting the evil that is around us, let us claim upon his promises because he has said that he will neither leave nor forsake us. He will always be with us. He's there to encourage and to support us the whole way. I pray that the, uh, the Lord bless us and the Lord give us the hope and help us to cling on to him, come rain, come sunshine, and never get shipwrecked in the shallows. May the Lord bless you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.